In most issues involving some kind of decision, one finds that there are differing perspectives. Usually, when the volume is turned up on one side, the other side responds likewise. On the 100th anniversary of the 1913 Land Act, we are in Dedwarrens, a small farming community in the Western Cape Winelands. Dedwarrens hit the headlines when protests by farm workers fed up with low wages turned violent. Just like thousands of farm workers across South Africa, workers here in Dedwarrens work the land but don't own it. And our government has failed to return much land into black hands despite repeated promises. To our north in Zimbabwe, more radical land redistribution has been criticized for increasing poverty and hunger in that country. So do calls for accelerated land reform in South Africa threaten our future, or are we simply postponing the inevitable? As the debate becomes more heated, when the polarities get stronger, that is, the situation may become more stuck. Both parties take up clear positions and become less and less open to the other's point of view. Here there's a choice to be made. Either the parties remain stuck to their own perspectives, circling round and round their own point of view, or they open up to the perspective of the other and begin to think together. Government argues that following years of unrest during apartheid, there was no option but to protect the rights of landowners. It was either that, or land grabs, and possibly a civil war. Three programs of land reform were set up to facilitate the redistribution of land ownership in an orderly and peaceful fashion. Firstly, land restitution allows people to lodge claims for stolen land, and yet some claims have been pending for more than a decade. Secondly, land tenure reform aims to make the lives of farm workers more secure, and yet a million farm workers have been forcefully removed from farms since 1994. Finally, land redistribution. It aims to make land available primarily for food production, but most farms redistributed to black farmers are no longer productive. As a result, government has missed its own target of redistributing 30% of land by 2014. To date, less than 8% has been redistributed. Commercial farmer interest groups such as Agri Westcape say they are committed to land reform, but are concerned about food security. If we do land reform, and we would like to have proper food security, then we need to make it work. Food security means that we will have a growing population which will double up until 2030. So that'll mean that we will have to double up our food production. Under the current system, dominated by a handful of commercial farmers, the country produces enough food to feed the nation. The irony is that farm workers are among the millions in the country who can't afford three meals a day. Faced with the reality of unemployment and food insecurity, Itemba Small Farmers Association decided to take matters into their own hands. In the late 90s, they occupied about 75 hectares of abandoned state-owned land and farmed on it, selling their produce and stock to the surrounding communities. Government has since taken them to court for their illegal land seizure. What is the problem of government? They say Vuku Zenzela, but if you do something, can you vacate the land? We don't want to go the Zimbabwean way. We fear it too. We are going to come to a point where we become like Zimbabwe. People are going to start to take the, the land by force. Let us look at the first option. Both parties can turn up the volume in the debate between them, each trying to convince the other that their own position is right and the other is wrong. The risk here is that the positions become even more entrenched. Entrenched positions have a nasty tendency of escalating conflicts. These conflicts can become destructive if we don't deal with them wisely. Here is how they develop. First of all, we notice that the problem becomes visible in a subtle way. It bubbles under the surface, so to speak. Deputy Minister of <coughs> Land Reform. You failed the people of Tembalet. You say to people, Fugu Zenzele, do things for yourself. That's what they've done it. They've occupied the land. Well, if you break the law, 
uh, where things are supposed to be done legally. That is wrong. Then the communication becomes problematic. The same party has been in power saying exactly the same thing every time. Why should we believe that this minister is going to change anything? First it becomes more formal, and in the end, it breaks down completely. Emotions are running high. I'll start with you, Petrus. We know that the land reform process has failed us. And we also know, we have to admit, that Agri-SA and all the agri-businesses and their affiliates are never going to give up. They already indicated that they are not going to pay the 150 rand per day to farm workers. So we have to organize our workers. We have to organize ourselves. We have to build the mess. And we have to take this land, whatever the cost will be. Still the Yager have to go back to his constituency and to tell them that we are organizing the people because your, your farms are not returning value to our people. It's only returning the value to your greedy white commercial farmers of South Africa and to the corrupt government of South Africa. So we are organizing our people. We'll take the farm back, whatever the costs are. The last phase is when the conflict comes out into the open. We see protests, sabotage, and finally, war violence, separation. The alternative, the second option, is to change the dynamic between the two groups or individuals and to begin to think together. Dialogue is the act or the art of thinking together, agreeing that we do not need to agree with each other. Part of the call for a shift towards a smallholder farm, for example, support, so that you do not overemphasize the commercial part of it, or else you support it. It's a crucial part of the shift that she's talking about we need to go into. That's what we are moving towards. In other words, there's recognition that without providing critical support in that area, we will not be able to go that route. The people in this room, yes, we, they don't want you here, you passing the buck to the global economy. No. Yes, it has an impact, but right now, yes. They were asking for six, for, to move from 69 rand a day to 150 rand a day yes. because they simply cannot afford to eat. Yes. What do you say to them? We get to choose between debates and even the risk of low or high level conflicts and dialogues. But do two wrongs make a right? No, it is, it is, it, it, we are correcting any historical injustice. Now, the government clearly has failed that it's not willing to do so. And people are therefore taking steps to correct this historical injustice. Everybody knows land was stolen, taken by force, by violence, by those who have it today. The biggest debate is between those who are committed to change within the ambit of, of the law and the constitution. And the masters of chaos and destruction who has never been on the production side of the economy and has never created anything, least of all a job. But what does dialogue entail? Dialogue implies a willingness to let go even momentarily of one's own perspective and open up to the perspective of the other. Ruth Hall, help us out here. What is it? Is it a moral, historical injustice? Is it an economic issue? Is it political will? Why are we just not making headway? Clearly, this is an unresolved historical grievance. And I think that we've heard that just in terms of how the audience has responded. But I feel that a deep irony is that a lot of the concessions that the ANC fought for in the context of our political transition, it has choose not, chosen not to use those powers, the powers to expropriate, to pay uh, compensation other than market value. So for some reason, the concessions that were fought very hard for have not really been used. But I think it is an economic issue. I think that uh, it's, it's easy just to say, well, we just need to do more land reform. There's something else at stake here that has not been clarified. And that is, while we have been going very slowly along the road of land reform, a very f profound shift has happened that is anti-poor in South Africa. And that is, we've globalized our agricultural sector. We have liberalized our economy. And now, people, farm workers, in places like the Durrance, where we are today, are affected not only by the fact that there are, uh, there are workers in a commercial farm, but they're, they're subject to the vagaries of global capitalism. This might mean that the parties first begin talking to each other 
instead of at each other. Then one side, let's say the authorities, move over and see what the problem looks like from the other side. The key point here is the agricultural sector in South Africa is based on slavery. And the ANC government has legislated that, that slavery. This is the problem that you see in the Durance. So before we can talk about wages, let us go first to address the land question. Let farm workers have their own land when they can make a choice whether I want to work for that guy or not. Then see what it is that motivates the authorities to see things as they do. That's exactly what we are preparing legislation for. The problem with the occupation of land, we had to go to court the other day to remove people from land they occupied because that land was returned to their owners. So other people then come and occupy it. This is the problem that happens when people occupy land illegally in that sense, that they've successfully gotten their, their land back and then people go and occupy it. This is the problem when it happens unsystematically. We want to create an effective system for people to access land. And when they do, they must get support. Uh, yeah. This is where the magic can happen. Often insights arise and new, a new reality emerges. I think, to be honest, that there's an element of fear and guilt on all of us landowners' part. Maybe not all of us are willing to admit it. But I think when you face up to the history of what happened in this country, of how the land came to be in the possession of the, of the privileged uh, white uh, um, elite that, that it is in the possession of, there's just no two ways about it. If we don't put it right ourselves, it eventually will be imposed on us in a way that will be far worse. I think the, the main difference really is, is what Mark started on the farm together with Richard Astor as his partner later was just to take responsibility themselves without any form of, of outside support other than commercial funding, which they secured themselves, and to just cut across, you know, from a practical perspective, all this red tape and just make sure that they put in place a structure that allowed for uh, joint ownership between the three parties, which was the two of them, together with the trust representing our disadvantaged workers and the residents as well. And then um, making sure that all the changes that we implemented on the program, we started before we became profitable and facilitating funding for that, again, off our own bat. We've had very little outside funding. Mm. I think the main thing is just to make it happen yourself. This sounds good to me. The workers have, um, their kids have good education. They've got quality health care. They have DSPV. In our experience, this happens more often than not when we reach this stage of the dialogue. Sometimes the emergence of a new shared perspective doesn't occur. By the way, let's go back to what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a property that you have no right to. This is stolen property. This is number one. You, this, is number, this is number one. Number two, we can't have a, a reform process based on charity. This is an insult to our people because this is our land. Our government, unfortunately, this government it will not do it. And so people like Mark, of course, it's a good thing to hear here, here and there. You know, we're doing good. We're taking care of our children and our workers and so on. But this is not real dignity for a people. We want to feel a citizen yeah, not dependent on the goodwill of these guys. But then at least the result is that the parties have begun to talk to each other. Flow is established and parties understand and respect one another's points of view. I think that the big question that we haven't resolved and that the ANC has not resolved, Minister, is what is the alternative vision? Yeah. Are we just going to take commercial farms and transfer them from one white owner to one black owner? Because that's primarily what is happening under the current yeah. proactive land acquisition strategy. Or are we going to break them up? Let's talk about what that vision is. I mean, if you had to address the people of the Doris yes, who are sitting yes. with us in this yes. room. What is it? Is it land or is it money in their pockets? She, no, she's right. At the end of the day, there's no question about the necessity to undo poverty as it is expressed in this area, but uh, blatant inequality. There's no question about that. It stares us in the face and we can't pussyfoot around it and we have to address it urgently. The problem, um, Deputy Minister, is yes. that we are sitting at the moment, 8% yes. of land has yes. been handed over. Yes. At this rate, it's going to take you more than a century to give back half of the land that should be returned. There have been green papers, there have mm. been plans, there have been acknowledgements. Yes. How long should people wait? Dialogue specializes in facilitating conversations, creating flow, 
when communication between parties with different points of view has become stuck.